Hello, everyone, and welcome to a new episode of the Written Page Podcast. And this is a very special episode because it's one that I have been wanting to record for years, well, perhaps for more than that, for decades. We're going to have a conversation in two parts with Donald Clark, one of the most interesting writers on music that I've ever had the pleasure to encounter. I've had his books for years, and I constantly reread them and return to them because I learn a lot every time I read them. He's the author of what I consider to be the best biographies of Frank Sinatra and Billie Holiday to date. He's also the author of the Penguin Encyclopedia of Popular Music and the essential essay, The Rise and Fall of Popular Music. He was born in Wisconsin, lived in England for many years, and joins us from his home in Colorado Springs. He joins us on the phone for a two-part conversation in which we will be discussing his books, among many other things. And this is the first part in which we will be talking about various topics, including writing, popular music, and of course, some of the books that I have mentioned. The Penguin Encyclopedia of Popular Music, The Rise and Fall of Popular Music, and also Wishing on the Moon, Life and Times of Billie Holiday. I started the conversation by going back to the very beginning of his life and by asking Donald Clark about his early years and his early interest in music. So, Donald, you were born in uh, Kenosha, Wisconsin, and I'm wondering what what are your earliest memories uh, that are related to music? Um, playing on the kitchen floor while my mother did the ironing. She listened to a lot of soap operas, um, Portia Faces Life and Ma Perkins and uh, all that kind of stuff. And um, But there was also music playing from time to time. And I heard uh, Les Brown playing uh, Bizet Has His Day, which uses a tune from Carmen or someplace. Um, no, not Carmen, or one of the suites. Anyway, you know, I heard a lot of big band music at the very end of the big band era. And um, then my grandma bought me a record player for my birthday when it must have been about 1947. It was a wind up. Uh, no, it wasn't. It was a, it had an electric turntable, but it was acoustic. I, and it used steel needles. Mm -hmm. And my mother started buying me a uh, little seven inch Kitty records, little golden records, they were called, 25 cents each, I think they were. And um, I started collecting folk music, what I thought were cowboy songs, Sweet Betsy from Pike and um, Clementine and uh, Oh Susanna and stuff like that. Uh, I thought they were cowboy songs because I was into cowboys. Later on, I decided they must have been folk songs. And finally, then when I was writing uh, The Rise and Fall of Popular Music, I realized that they were uh, pop hits of the 19th century. They sold a lot of sheet music. So um, that's how I got into the whole history of the music business, kind of sideways. So I'm wondering how uh, important uh, was uh, radio in those early years for you? It, I think it's pretty hard to understand for current generations how uh, important that medium was for uh, the development of music, the transmission of music, uh, bringing the country together. Could you talk a little bit about that? Oh yeah, the, um, the radio was very important. Um, I soon decided that uh, I wouldn't be able to rely on the radio to be able to hear music that I wanted to hear. Most of the music I heard on the radio didn't interest me very much, but I kept up with uh, whatever was popular, whatever was selling. But uh, by and large, radio reached a lot of people and uh, promoted uh, record sales and it helped to make hit records and so forth. And that was why all the uh, all the fuss in the 1940s between the record companies, and the broadcasters, um strikes uh 
by the musicians union and so forth that was all nonsense because all the media helped to sell records which you know and the musicians got royalties so what could what could one object to in retrospect that was all pretty silly but um then there was the theme music of the soap operas and the radio programs uh there was a program about the fbi which used russian music <laughs> as a the <theme. laughs> The uh, Prokofiev, uh, Love for Three Oranges, a march. And I wonder if J. Edgar Hoover knew that his FBI program was paying royalties to a Soviet composer. I <laughs> doubt it. Anyway, uh, and then there was a, in the studio for the soap operas, there would be an organ playing uh, Finiculi, Finicula, an Italian pop song, and uh, all kinds of stuff. A tune from Tchaikovsky's Sixth Symphony. So I was picking up a lot of things, and all on the radio. Now it seems well, it, it seems I interesting to me, that Donald. I buy records. <laughs> I, <laughs> not that I wanted to to, to uh, cut you off, but I, I, it seems interesting to me to see how in those days uh, all different types of music were actually broadcast on the radio. It doesn't seem to be the same way now. Oh yeah, even on television, there used to be live concerts by the Chicago Symphony Orchestra with Fritz Reiner and uh, the NBC. Symphony Orchestra was Toscanini. Those days are gone forever. Um, I think advertisers and corporations used to do that as a sort of what they saw as a sort of public service, their duty, you know, mm -hmm. like uh, at Columbia Records, they recorded Duke Ellington, even though he wasn't making any money in those years, uh, because they were supposed to. The guys who were running the record companies in those days were all musicians, and music lovers. Um, That began to change during the rock and roll era. The uh, Yetnikov, who was the boss at Columbia in the late 60s and 70s, his girlfriend said he was tone deaf. He couldn't tell one song from another. <laughs> I don't know if that's true or not, but the, that whole landscape has just changed irretrievably. It's gone forever. Just like Kenosha. When I was growing up there, there weren't any shootings. Nowadays, there's a shooting almost every day. Well, it's a in 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 that sense, it is it is it is a change for the for for the worse, absolutely. Uh, but uh, do you think uh, that that same um, thing could apply to the way uh, music has evolved? Uh, do you think that the music of your youth was better music than what uh, is sold nowadays? Uh, how do you see that? Um, I don't know much about how music is sold nowadays because uh, there aren't any more record shops and I'm mostly into classical nowadays as well as jazz but um, I don't think broadcasting affected the music itself in the um, in the most important sense very much. Uh, mm -hmm. There were always a lot of imitators. Whatever was popular, somebody else, a lot of, a lot of people would copy it, you know, in order to make money. But the artists that came along that we regard nowadays as significant um, were always doing their own thing. They were always inventing something new. Nancy Griffiths has just passed away. You know who she was? Oh, absolutely, she yes. Was, huh? She was a country, mm -hmm. basically country, but she was also a folky. She was combining country music and folk music and writing her own songs and just doing her own thing. One of her record companies told her that her uh, her uh, records would never be heard on the radio because her voice hurt people's ears, which was nonsense. She had a gorgeous voice, mm -hmm. and she was a wonderful interpreter. And she just didn't listen to any of that stuff. She went on doing her, what she was doing and uh, uh, was immensely popular all her life with the record-buying public. I saw her at concert at the University of East Anglia in England in the 1970s. And um, those are the artists who last. Those are the artists whose records will keep selling as long as people buy records, whether they download them or steal them or listen to them on Spotify or whatever. Uh, and the imitators, the people who are the most influenced by jukeboxes and radio stations, most of them will fall by the wayside, in my opinion. Yeah, and I think uh, that's very much in tune with 
the kind of artists that you have written about. And so I'm wondering, uh, Donald, from being uh, uh, interested in music the way you were in your early days and in your youth, how did you go from that stage to actually uh, writing about music? Um, well, I was a writer. Um, funnily enough, my mother started taking me to the library when I was a little kid, and I could never find anything I wanted to read. Um, but, and uh, English was always my best subject in school, and, I, and then I almost didn't graduate from high school on account of my senior English teacher, who was borderline senile, I think. And I didn't know what an essay was. I didn't know what a term paper was. I didn't know what I was doing half the time, but I liked writing. I wrote letters to the uh, local newspaper, um, arguing with the conservatives, basically. And um, they'd write back and so forth. And then the editor of the Kenosha Evening News, as it then was, got in touch with me and uh, wanted to know more about me. And he finally sent me to Chicago to a company that um, gave me some kind of intellectual examination to find out whether I really had anything on the ball or not. I don't remember very much about that, but um, I was I was seen to be a diamond in the rough. And that's when I, meanwhile, all this time, the entire decade of the 1960s, I was working in the car factory, American Motors, where we made Ramblers. And they were good cars, too. Mm -hmm. uh, there was, in one year, we actually built and sold more cars than Chrysler. But anyway, now the com that company's gone completely, just like the record stores. Um, that convinced me. That experience of, of having written a lot of letters to newspaper to the newspaper and um, having been encouraged by Howard Brown, I think his name was, the editor of the Kenosha Evening News, that I should be doing something else. And then I went to um, the local vocational school to hear some adult evening lectures and uh, i heard a shakespeare lecture that blew me away and i thought this is what i'm supposed to be doing listening to lectures and history and music um, and um, history and literature and um, so i eventually left the car factory and went to college now i got a pension from the car factory of about 37 dollars a month because i got my 10 years in <laughs> I was I was surprised when I found out I had a pension coming, but I was not surprised to find out how small it was. <laughs> and then, uh, um, in college, I was working in a record store where the manager was uh, became a good friend. Chuck Nessa is a terrific record producer. I don't know if you know any of the records on the Nessa label, but he was one of the people who first recorded the Art Ensemble of Chicago. Mm -hmm. And um, I started learning a lot more about music from him. He introduced me to the conductor, Yasha Hornstein, who's still my favorite conductor. He died in 1973, but I've got every record he ever made, and bootleg broadcasts and everything. Um, and I wrote an article about Hornstein and sold it to the New Republic, which mm -hmm. was my first piece of published work. And the New Republic was my favorite magazine in those days. It was a weekly back then, and uh, it was left of center, not really left wing, but <laughs> le unless you're Donald Trump, then it's very left wing. <laughs> and um, then I went to England to do 10 weeks of student teaching, and I was majoring in education, and that was my uh, last term at university. And when I um, finished that, I had an honors degree in education with which uh, adding two bucks to that, I can get a cup of coffee at Starbucks. <laughs> and uh, went down to London and got a job in publishing. And uh, eventually, then I met my wife and uh, we were both working in publishing and we, we realized that we didn't have to give our ideas for books and things to our employer, we could sell them ourselves to other publishers and packagers. Uh, a packager in London in the 1970s, a packager was somebody who put together an il illustrated books for publishers who didn't want to have to start their own division to do that themselves. So uh, 
you'd have an idea for a book and take it to a packager and the packager would say, yeah, that, okay, that's a good idea. And, uh, and the packager would help you get together the illustrations and, uh, design the book and so forth. And I decided to try to sell an idea for an encyclopedia of music. And I had this grandiose plan for, a uh, two large format illustrated volumes, like a poor man's grove or something, <laughs> um, including classical music, including everything. Reasoning that it's all related in one way or another. Everything influences everything else. And uh, I took that to a packager. Bruce Marshall, his name was, and he was a nice guy. And my wife uh, did one job with him. Her first book, in fact, it was a gardening book. And um, he loved the idea, but he said, uh, it's not an illustrated book. And I only do illustrated books, so I can't do it for you. Uh, in other words, throw out the pictures. That's a bad idea. <laughs> and uh, he also said, I would throw out the classical music. And then the light bulb went on over my head. There were encyclopedias of jazz and encyclopedias of country music and encyclopedias of rock and roll. And as far as I was concerned, it was all related. Uh, I was just talking about Nancy Griffith a moment ago, and she was she touched all the bases, but her, and yet her music was completely original. Um, and there had never been a reference book to the entire subject of popular music, treating it like a great broad mainstream. Um, and that's how I saw it. That's how I experienced it. Um, so I, I called up Penguin Viking Penguin Books in London one day, and I said, put me through to the guy who does those reference books. There were little paperback, mass market paperbacks, the Penguin Encyclopedia of Computers, the Penguin Encyclopedia of Biology, Geology, and this and that. So she puts me through to this guy called John Denny, and I started talking. And uh, I told him I had published some magazine articles, and uh, uh, so I knew I could write, and um, told him about my idea for an encyclopedia of popular music, treating popular music as commercial music as opposed to classical music. If you can't make a living at it, you don't give up your day job. That's what popular music is. No matter whether you want to play uh, jazz piano or country music guitar or rock and roll drums or sing on Broadway or whatever, um, you got to make a living. And uh, I talked and talked, and when I ran out, ran out of breath, John Denny said, that's an awfully big book you're talking about. And I had him. I knew I had him. I had him. <laughs> I had hooked him. All I had to do was prove that I could do it. Um, I wrote a whole bunch of entries and I found a collaborator who turned out to be worthless. And uh, luckily, after the contract was signed, he wasn't doing anything. So, But when we got his name off the contract, so it was all mine in the end. I had a lot of helpers, but... Um, a lot of them, a lot of the stuff they gave me was worthless. Like they wanted um, the Duke Ellington entry and the Bob Dylan entry and the uh, um, Johnny and the Milkman entry and what to be all the same length. You know, mm -hmm. they didn't get it. The importance of the artist dictated the length, mm -hmm. and we weren't going to we weren't going to include a lot of uh, one hit wonders. So I ended up rewriting a lot of stuff and it's basically very very much my book in 1989 the penguin encyclopedia of popular music came out it was supposed to take two years and it took five years which is typical publishing nothing ever happens on time and um halfway through they told me they were going to have a hardback first edition which was a big thrill we thought it was going to be you know a paperback from the start and um, it was kind of an honor to have it in the hardback. And then um, the idiot in New York who was in charge of buying books uh, from the sister company in London refused to order enough copies of the hardback. So there had to be, and, and it sold well in this country when it was published, and there had to be a very expensive reprint of the hardback because this dope wouldn't listen to anybody. It's a, uh, oh, I got all kinds of stories about publishing, but um, that book uh, made me a lot of friends. It got me interviews interviews on the radio up and down Britain and uh, 
it was all a lot of fun. And I got royalties uh, on that book until well, for 10 years. Every six months or so, um, five or six hundred pounds sterling. I forget how much, but it was nice getting a royalty check. <laughs> I haven't had one of those for years. <laughs> <laughs> you know, Donald, I, I had a copy of this of this book in the years before the Internet when I began to do radio. And uh, it was a pleasure to have so much information in one uh, place. And I used this Penguin Encyclopedia of Popular Music quite a bit when I was on radio first uh, in Spain, uh, northwestern Spain, where I was born, and then here in the United States uh, after I uh, moved here. And really, uh, it was really a great idea because it also... Uh, made me understand for the first time when I was a teenager uh, what you understood to be popular music, uh, which you equate with uh, commercial music. And I thought that was, you know, that was a big eye-opener for me because, you know, my father had a huge record collection and he had all kinds of records of different styles, uh, you know, both classical and popular. But I never understood growing up what the difference was between one and the other. And th reading this book and 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 checking information out in this book really uh, opened my eyes to that to, to to that fact. Now this book can be found on your uh, web website, Donald Clark's Music Box, um, on the internet. But uh, in the days before the internet, it was it was it was a huge help for me. I can tell you that. Yeah, well, I came along at just the right time. There aren't any more reference books now. Everything's on the Internet. The only thing wrong with the book was that um, we wrote it in an extreme sort of telegraph ease, mm -hmm. uh, leaving out all the little words and using a lot of abbreviations so that it wasn't, uh, it wasn't much fun to read, really. It was just a reference book. Mm -hmm. But the, the version that's on my website now has had a, has had a lot of uh, entries rewritten, especially the longer ones, and uh, a lot of that ameliorated. So um, it's more fun to read, more fun to look at, I think, the way it is now. The reason we were trying to save space so frantically is that Penguin told me that they could only publish a paperback of a maximum of 1,800 pages, which was a lie. They just didn't want to spend the money to publish a paperback larger than that. So that was the rest restriction we had, that we had to uh, save as much space as possible. And then there was a second edition, um, which was redesigned, slightly smaller typeface and so forth, so that uh, there was more room and there were some more entries. But it's still basically a 20th century popular music. I'm not trying to keep it up to date anymore because uh, today's today you can look up your favorite pop group on the on the internet. You don't need my book. <laughs> <laughs> how, how did you go about selecting the the, the entries based based on uh, your readings, based on your tastes? Uh, how, how did you decide who to put in and who to leave out? Oh, uh, that was so funny. About halfway through, John Denny um, asked me about my entry for the Smiths, who were uh, very popular amongst the uh, kind of people who lived in bedsits in the 70s in London, uh, young people. Uh, and I had heard of the Smiths. I knew about them. They were going to be in the book. But I said to John, I said, who? <laughs> and he did a double take. He thought I didn't know who the Smiths were, and he began to be worried about the whole project. But I got a, I got a rise out of him that time. Um, there are there are quite a few one hit wonders. For example, uh, because um, the one hit like Louie Louie, mm -hmm. you know that song. Mm -hmm. That's not only uh, was that an important hit record, even though that group never had any other hits. Um, but it was also a very interesting story about how the record was made and about why it sounds so weird and um, um, all kinds of things. So that, you know, that made a, then that's, that's another thing. We wanted to have the gee whiz factor in the book, you mm -hmm. know, the golly, I didn't know that sort of factor. 
and, and I, I've been doing that since I first started working in publishing. I used to work on How It Works, which was basically for teenage boys mm-hmm. about how, think, how things work. And I put together this um, encyclopedia of how it works. After This was a part work, thousands and thousands of pages. And then I moved to the, and that was for two years. And when that was finished, I went to the books division and started recycling it all. And um, Marshall Cavendish was the name of the company I was working for. And they sold an edition of this encyclopedia of how it works from Abacus to Zoom Lens to an American publisher. And um, at publication time, they wanted about a thousand lines of corrections, strip-ins. Back in those days, we were using film. And um, the production department came to me and they said, we're not going to do this. We can't do this. It's time to print the book. Write them a letter. Tell them anything. <laughs> <laughs> so I wrote, I wrote to this publisher in New York saying, um, look, I'll tell you what. I'm an American. I used to work in a car factory. And when the boss wasn't looking and I didn't have anything to do, I was reading English novels so that I knew what a bed set was before I came to London. <laughs> and uh, um, when I was preparing this uh, article about how television works, I did not know that there were three international incompatible methods of broadcasting and receiving color television. Mm-hmm. So if your friend makes you a video in England and sends it to you, you won't be able to watch it on your American video player. I didn't know that until I started writing this article. And um, every kid who reads your book, this book, they wanted me to replace that whole section because it didn't have to do specifically with American broadcasting, mm-hmm. which is unbelievably stupid. I did that. I didn't use the the word stupid. But I told them, I said, every kid who reads this is going to is, is, is going to slap his forehead and say, I didn't know that. And he's never going to forget where he learned it. Don't underestimate your readers. And um, I wish to hell I'd kept a copy of that letter because um, after a week or two, the production department came to me and said, what did you tell them? I think they're going to frame your letter and hang it on the wall. <laughs> they wanted, you know, they wanted the U taken out of color. And uh, they, they wanted the U taken out of neighborhood and all those all that kind of stuff. They wanted a thousand lines of stripping at press time. So um, I, that's what I wrote to them. And they saw the point immediately. And there were no more problems on that score. And it's the same thing with um, writing entries for, encyc- for an encyclopedia about music. Don't under- underestimate your readers, but tell them what they want to know. All the stuff I've ever worked on was I've, I've always tried to write the kind of book that I would want to buy mm-hmm. if I wanted to if I wanted to buy a book about Sinatra or Billy Holiday or whoever. What would I want to read about? And that's uh, so that to some extent that's um, dictated how I chose the entries, and then my um, contributors. Uh, often came up with good ideas. They told me that I, I should include so and so. It might it might be somebody that I never heard of, but that's okay. I listened to that kind of advice because these were people who knew that kind of music better than I did. Um, I was never a big follower of, 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 of obscure pop music, and there are probably entries in the book that uh, I could throw out now and nobody would miss them. But um, I like to leave it as big as possible. Because you never know what people are going to want to look up. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I agree with that. And, uh, you know, uh, you mentioned Sinatra, you mentioned uh, Billy Holiday, and we'll talk about those books in, in just a second. But I, I, I do want to mention, uh, as you did yourself, that from Wisconsin, you uh, after you went to college, you ended up living in uh, England. And I'm wondering uh, how living in Europe, how living in England, uh, influence your life and, and your approach to music in particular? I don't think it uh, influenced me that way at all. It was just, I, I do think that if I had if I hadn't gone to live overseas, I never would have got a chance to do any of this stuff. Because um, in Kenosha, Wisconsin, or, or in a lot of what they call flyover country, there isn't any live music to speak of except your mm-hmm. local rock band, you know. 
with most of most of those people nobody ever hears of. Uh, they play in taverns, and that's it. Uh, in Detroit, there was a thriving jazz scene uh, for for decades. But um, um, basically, if I, I would have had to live in New York in order to get probably in order to get a chance to um, get a contract with a major publisher, any kind of contract. Whereas in Britain, um, for example, all the newspapers reviewed books. Uh, and the uh, publicity people at the publishers knew all the editorial people who were in charge of book reviewing. And it was just, um, it was a world that valued itself. Mm -hmm. It was, uh, you know, it was a world that thought that books were important. And uh, the Kenosha News, I have to say that it's called the Kenosha News now, and I've been subscribing to it lately because I got a good deal on the digital download <laughs> edition. And um, the newspaper business is going completely to hell. Um, a lot of newspapers that used to have book review sections every week don't do that anymore. And uh, the newspaper here in Colorado Springs, where I live now, is the worst newspaper, I've, worst excuse for a newspaper I've ever seen. But the Kenosha News is one of the best local papers I've seen since I don't know when. I don't know why that should be, but it is. Uh, but they don't. Um, the only book reviews they carry, they they get from um, AP or UP, um, you know, the wire services. Mm -hmm. So uh, there aren't, there isn't a full time book reviewer at um, any newspaper that I know of. A friend of mine used to be the editor of the book review section at um, the Chicago Tribune, and um, he's retired now, fortunately, because that job disappeared a long time ago, which is a great shame. But um, even back then, the publishers themselves were located in, in big cities, uh, leaving the car factory and going to uh, university. There are small publishers that publish interesting stuff, but most of the people in the country never hear about that stuff because precisely because they are small publishers with limited distribution. Um, so it's a crazy scene, but as, as far as my attitude to music or, um, any of the arts, it, it was just, it was more accessible. I went to a lot of good concerts in London, mm -hmm. but, um, it didn't change my attitude towards the music. The only thing that changed was, um, that I got, I went to very few concerts when I lived in Wisconsin. As I say, there wasn't very much local music and live music. And um, so it was. Um, I don't know if that made any difference or not. I doubt it because I still listen to a lot of records. I was always buying records. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I can I can understand that because I lived in South Dakota for a while and uh, <laughs> there wasn't much <laughs> music to speak of around there. I can, I can tell you that for sure. Now, one of the... Uh, uh, books that I have in my hand right here, uh, right now, is uh, the biography of Billie Holiday that you wrote. This is the uh, uh, Da Capo edition, although the original one was published in 1994, and the book was called Wishing on the Moon, Life and Times of Billie Holiday, which I can tell you truly, this is my favorite biography of Billie Holiday that I have ever had the chance to read. Uh, and you know, I'm wondering, Donald, did you uh, publish this uh, biography on the strength of the Penguin Encyclopedia of Popular Music? Uh, how did this project come about to write a biography of Lady Day? My editor um, at Viking Penguin in London, John Denny, went away. I never, and I never heard from him again. I don't know where he went, but he he left the company for some reason, and. Um, so my new editor was John Riley, who uh, was the best thing that ever happened to me in my publishing career. And he liked the entry I had written for Billie Holiday in the encyclopedia, because I was already harping on the fact that she was not a loser or a dish rag. She was actually a feisty gal who uh, made a lot of money and spent it all and had a good time in spite of everything did pretty much as she pleased and um, that book that she did not write her so-called autobiography lady sings the blues mm -hmm. that was written to sell to the movies that's why it was full of doom and gloom 
she had strong opinions, but uh, her ghostwriter, Bill Dufty, uh, who wrote that book for her, told, described her as the funniest woman he'd ever known. So I knew that there was, and anyway, I'd been listening to her records for decades, and I knew that she wasn't a, a, a helpless, a nothing. She was a real person, and I wanted to try to get that across. And then, um, so my editor wanted to, John Riley wanted to sign me up to write a biography of Billy Holiday, and of course I said yes. Um, if you're a writer and somebody offers you a contract, you sign it, and they give you some money, and then you write whatever they want. <laughs> but I was frightened, frankly, but at the prospect of writing a book about Billy Holiday because she'd been dead for quite a few years, um, almost half a century, and all the people who knew her were dead, most of them. And um, all I could do was go and cobble together everything that had ever been written about her and try to make a good job of it. And then we heard about this incredible archive of interviews that um, had been compiled by a woman called Linda Cool, um, who had a contract to write a book about Billie Holiday, and then she died. Mm -hmm. um, apparently, she jumped out of a hotel room window, and if she did, I think part of the reason was because she couldn't write a book. She was very good at interviewing people, and uh, she compiled a whole interviews with nearly a hundred people who um, many of whom had known Billy Holiday from when she was a kid in uh, Baltimore called Eleonora Harris or uh, she never went by the name Harris although that's the name on her birth certificate birth certificate um, and we managed to buy the right to use this material from the guy who had bought it from Linda Cool's estate and uh, then I was away. I was off and running. I had some material, some terrific material to work with that no one else had ever seen, basically. There was another guy who wrote a book who, uh, he was commissioned to write a book by the owner of the material. And I read his book and I enjoyed it, but he didn't make very much use of it. Yes. Whereas uh, I squeezed every drop out of it so that... Um, in my book, I think you're just, you're just about with Billie Holiday almost every day of her life until, uh, you know, she and her mother ended up in New York City and um, all kinds of things happened to them. And she made her first record with Benny Goodman. And uh, then she started recording all those marvelous small group sides with um, Teddy Wilson and um, all about who she was hanging out with and what they were up to and how they got by. And uh, I think it's I think I think it's a pretty good book. And I agree with that. And I think you know one of the things about your writing, Donald, this that, that I find really uh, appealing is that when I read one of your books, not, not only do I feel like I am close to the person that you are uh, writing a biography of, but I feel like you are telling me the story. And then you have uh, such great command of the music as well. You know the music so well. And to me, this is very important because if I'm interested in Billie Holiday or Frank Sinatra or uh, Bing Crosby or whoever it is, uh, Duke Ellington, it's mostly because of the music, not so much because of the life, even though the life is, of course, uh, interwoven in the music and, and vice versa. Uh, you, you're, uh, what I'm trying to get at is that I think your writing style is, is very appealing, and I'm wondering how that developed. Who, who, who were your models, or, or how do you set about writing these books in such a compelling way? I don't know. I can't answer that question. I don't remember having any models. Uh, I've never been able to read very much Ernest Hemingway. They say that um, his writing was almost a template for 20th century writing, that the way he wrote. And uh, the only thing I know about him is that he said it was important to have a good ship detector. Mm -hmm. Which mean you know, which means you know how how to tell uh, bullshit when you when you see it or hear it or read it, and I I think I just learned how to write from reading everything that I read. Mm -hmm. um, um, I don't remember reading very the New Yorker very much, but then when I lived in England, I was reading the Spectator, and before that, I was reading the New Republic, and I think in retrospect, all the all the stuff I read was well written. That's all I can say. 
Mm-hmm. And so I don't like what's happening to the language nowadays. Um, because it's 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 always happening. The language is always changing, but it seems to me that it's changing more and more nowadays, and not for the better. Um, where did the word defund come from? As in defund the police. Mm-hmm. If it means anything, it means taking away the money from the police. And if they do that, then all the cops will go go do something else for a living, and we won't have any cops. People, the, the media and the uh, commentators and the uh, the deplorables are constantly making up stuff like that, and it um, it makes it um, demeans the language. It makes it harder to communicate. Uh, I never, I never had any trouble with that. I always, I think I always know how to find the right word mm-hmm. without without having to mislead anybody. Um, my brother, who was um, an unhappy man and uh, didn't give anybody too much credit, Um, did tell me once that I was an awfully good writer, which pleased me. And um, I mentioned Chuck Nessa. He he said uh, on a music website that uh, reading my book was just like uh, hearing me speak as if I was talking the story myself, which I thought was also a compliment. Mm-hmm. So I don't know how I got that way. I just um, sprang from the Godhead or something. I don't know. <laughs> you know, one of the reasons why I was asking you this is because one of the biggest trends right now in English departments across universities, which is the medium that I know pretty well, is creative writing. And I've always wondered whether creative writing can be taught. What do you think about that? I don't know. I um Creative writing, I guess, would uh, to me that means poetry and, and literature, novels, fiction, and so on. And um, I can't do that. Um, it would be too much work. I, I would take uh, the rest of my life to write a few pages. Uh, I had a complet teacher at the university who called it com- uh, imaginative. What did he call it? Um, comparative literature mm-hmm. called it imaginative literature, I guess, which was a fancy way of saying fiction. Mm-hmm. And uh, I don't have that kind of imagination. I don't think I would find that very difficult. I would, I should have been a journalist, I suppose. Or a, um, I wonder what would have happened if I tried to talk Howard Brown into giving me a job at the Kenosha Evening News instead of leaving the car factory and going to college. I probably would have ended up a second-rate journalist and never published the book at all. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> Which would have been a loss for all of us readers. And I'll tell you, uh, uh, as an essay, the next book I'd like to uh, concentrate a little bit on is, it, it's, in my opinion, absolutely outstanding, The Rise and Fall of Popular Music. This is a book that I found in Nashville, Tennessee, uh, when I was living there, uh, and I bought a used copy of it. And it took me probably two days to read from cover to cover uh, because it was just impossible to put it down. It's it's one of my favorite books of yours uh, because it's always thought provoking. Uh, It's very rich. It's 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 very deep in many ways. It has a lot of opinions in there. And I agree with some and I don't agree with others. But agreeing or not agreeing is not important. What is important to me about this book is that it makes me rethink what my beliefs or what my feelings or, you know, uh, what I think about. Uh, you know, a, a specific artist or a specific kind of music or, or something like, like, like that. Uh, l- let's talk briefly uh, about the, uh, the 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 title, the rise and fall of popular uh, uh, music. What, what, where do you um, think that rise should be uh, placed, and 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 what is that fall? When did it happen, uh, and 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 why? Um. Well, a little while ago, we were talking about radio, and I guess the rise of popular music would be when uh, a lot of it was available, and uh, anybody could hear any kind of music they wanted if they listened to enough the radio enough, um, and um, all kinds of things enter into that. Second World War threw a lot of people together, city slickers and hillbillies, and, 
um, they learned a little bit about each other's cultures and uh, they listened to each other's music or at least they were made aware of it. And then uh, the record industry cooperated and cut V discs so that GIs uh, between battles could listen to um, classical music and jazz and all kinds of music. Um, after the war, I think in about 1946, there was a survey of all the GIs who were still in Europe uh, to find out who their favorite singer was. And everybody thought it was going to be Frank Sinatra. And um, to their astonishment, it turned out to be Roy Acuff, mm -hmm. big country music star. Mm -hmm. And that's, um, and then there was, uh, speaking of radio, when I was a kid, I was listening to, to uh, the WLS Barn Dance mm -hmm. from Chicago mm -hmm. uh, on my grandma's um, kitchen radio uh, whenever I visited her house. Um, so everybody could listen to every kind of music. And that's when um, all, the, all, the, all the different kinds of music had influenced each other, but that became even more pronounced, I think. And um, so the Billboard pop chart started in 1940, but then um, pretty soon there had to be a, a Billboard country music chart and a Billboard race music chart, they mm -hmm. called it in those days. And then in the late 40s, they started calling it rhythm and blues. Um, because uh, that music was making money. It was heard on jukeboxes. So that was the rise of it as far as commercial music is concerned. And I I don't think I realized at the time how, to what extent I was writing a book about the music industry rather than the music itself. Well, I was writing about the music itself, but the, the music industry had to come along. In fact, uh, the only reason anybody was going to buy my book was because everybody was aware that there is country music, there is folk music, there is jazz, there is Broadway show tunes. Um, Whereas I suppose there was a time when people wouldn't were, were not so aware of each other's music. And then the fall came when the commercialism started taking over completely. When uh, the record companies, the big record companies, the major labels were no longer being run by people who knew and loved music. But they were lawyers and um, corporate executives. Um, and they, they just wanted, uh, like Chuck Nessa said to me once, they don't want to sell um, 10,000 copies each of 100 records. They want to sell a million copies of one record. Mm -hmm. And that doesn't work. You know, you got to you got to give people a lot of music and let them choose what's going to be the hit. Um and it got worse and worse until now we don't even have any record stores anymore. And nobody, uh, a lot of people want their music for free. They steal it or they listen to it on Spotify, paying a small fee. The recording artists don't get very much money out of it. Um, the good thing is that maybe uh, live performance is more important than ever. And uh, a lot of people have pointed that out used to be that a, a record was a way of promoting your act. You got more bookings if you had a hit record. And then the rec records took over completely. Mm -hmm. And maybe that was the beginning of the fall. And uh, nowadays, if you're a serious musician, songwriter, performer, you got to be on the road. You got to perform live in front of people. And, that, and that's the way it used to be. And maybe that's the way it should be. But um, the music industry has certainly, from most people's point of view, just about disappeared. Mm -hmm. Well, that's one of the things that I find interesting about this book in particular, because I feel like uh, when one reads a book about, let's say, the big band era, uh, I feel like writers often tend to value the music of the big band era, and then everything that came after they don't value at all. And likewise, when you read a book about rock and roll or the Beatles or whatever it is, it feels like nothing that came before uh, was of any value until the moment when John Lennon and Paul McCartney got together or the moment when Elvis Presley uh, appeared or whatever it is. You know, uh, you, you don't do that in this book. Uh, and I really appreciate that because you are able to see 
the value of the music itself, but you concentrate uh, a lot more when it comes to determining what the rise and what the fall of popular music is. You concentrate a lot more on the music industry and the business and how, as you say, this concept that uh, the music industry at some point uh, began to be run by people who were not really interested in the music. Because I have a feeling, Donald, that after all, what you are really interested in is the music itself. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Um, what was I going to say? I wrote in the book somewhere that um, when Elvis Presley happened, I was in high school, and um, a lot of people think, you hit, they hear the phrase popular music, and they think, oh, it all began with Heartbreak Hotel by uh, Elvis Presley. And um, in fact, of course, it's got a long history. And... Um, Elvis Presley was selling music in the country music chart, but he was also singing the blues. Mm -hmm. And um, I knew where he was coming from. I was almost the only kid in my high school who wasn't astonished. You know, <laughs> what the hell is this? Everybody was saying. And um, the music is more fun that way, actually. I'm, uh, I'm reading now uh, Michael Gilmore. Spells his first name M I K A L, but it's Michael. Mm -hmm. uh, he used to write for Rolling Stone for years and years, I guess, which I hardly ever looked at, so I, I didn't know that. I've only heard about him recently, but uh, I see him on Facebook a lot. And he wrote, he he reprinted, he posted uh, a, an article he wrote years and years ago about Rubber Soul, the Beatle album. Mm -hmm. And I thought it was a terrific piece of writing. And um, I messaged him to say that I wish I could go back to that era. I was buying the Be I was buying Beatle records. I don't have any of them anymore, but I was enjoying them. And I thought they were wrote some pretty good songs. Some of their early stuff was dated badly, like yeah, 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 you know. But mm -hmm. um, they were important because they moved things. And uh, I wrote to Michael that I wish I could go back to that era and pay more attention mm -hmm. because uh, there are things like that going on all the time, really. But uh, maybe in smaller and smaller circles nowadays. I don't know. I don't go to any of the music festivals. Um, and that's where um, there's one in... There's a blues festival in Memphis, and there's the, uh, mm -hmm. I can't remember the name of any of the other festivals that people get all excited about, but that's where uh, people go who are making a living at it by playing live rather than relying on record sales. And uh, I think that's very important and very interesting. And I don't expect it ever to stop because music is too important. No matter what happens in the music industry, people are going to be making music everywhere, and that's all there is to it. Do you do you think it's uh, important to have a certain historical distance in order, a certain historical distance in order to uh, understand better cultural phenomena such as you know the swing era or the rise of rock and roll or whatever it is? Uh, do you think you benefited from the fact that that you wrote a book about Sinatra long before, long after, sorry, he 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 actually came on the scene, or 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 the fact that you said before that. Uh, Billie Holiday had been uh, gone for over 40 years when you wrote a book about her. Do you think uh, that helped you in any way? Do you think that's necessary in order to write a book that assesses a uh, historical cultural phenomenon like that? Oh, absolutely. The more you know, the better you can write about it. Um, take the big band era, for example. The, the, the Depression was still on when the, when the bands were at their peak in the 1930s. And then there was the Second World War, and a lot of bands um, suffered a lot because the musicians kept getting drafted. But um, as I wrote somewhere in the 1930s, during the Depression, a musician could live on $20 a week. And that's important. They were making good music. They were having a good time. And uh, um, you could get a meal in a restaurant for 25 cents or whatever. And... Um, it's important to understand things like that. That's where the music came from. That's why the music had the quality it did. Even though there was a terrible depression on and a war was coming, um, in the 1930s, a lot of happy music was made. 
people were getting on with their lives and they were making music because they loved it, because they wanted to make it. And even if they were never going to get rich, they kept on doing it. And then um, the reason the big band era folded up was because uh, after World War II, it was no longer economical to keep a big band on the road. Mm -hmm. during, the, during the war, a lot of dance halls had closed and um, the size of the average musical group fell. They all became combos. Um, and only a handful of people like Woody Herman and Duke Ellington and Count Basie were able to keep bands going. Whereas any time in the 1930s, there were dozens of bands touring the country, the whole country, black bands, white bands, all kinds of bands. And, um, you know, as I say, as I've always said, economics and uh, demography, um, changes in the population, people moving to the cities from the countryside it's all it all goes into the mix it all affects the music in that sense there's a beautiful piece of writing by gene lee's called pavilion in the rain that uh, talks about the end of the uh, big band eras that I, the era that i have always found to be incredibly poetic and really historically accurate as well and it kind of goes in line with what you are uh, mentioning and i find very interesting to read your afterword uh, to, to, to this book, The Rise and Fall of Popular Music. The afterword at the very end, uh, page 558 in my edition here, uh, because you talk about the possible future of the music business, but you do this in the mid-90s before the internet came on the scene. Uh, and, you know, back then it would be very difficult, impossible really, to imagine what what was coming uh, very briefly uh donald i i wonder what you think about what the impact of the internet has been on popular music oh well, it's, um, that's a very big subject and i guess it's impossible to say because um because we don't know what the business would be like today if it hadn't been for the internet we've got nothing to compare it to mm -hmm. Uh, the knowledge of the music and the, uh, the fandom um, is all on the net now, I suppose. But that's where people find out what's what and they find out what they might want to go here if they get a chance to go and hear something locally. Um, so I don't know if it's changed very much, actually, because the uh, I think the big change was the record business. Mm -hmm. Um, records became a throwaway commodity. Um, a kid could go to the record store and kids had enough money finally with the depression and the war and everything else long over. You could go to the record shop every week and buy a few 45 singles. And so um, it became a throwaway commodity and I think that was the most important thing. I don't know if the internet really changed that very much mm -hmm. because uh, People listen to music once, and if they like it, they come back and listen to it again. But uh, if they don't like it, they don't listen to it again. And that's it's, it's pretty much the way it's always been mm -hmm. ever since uh, there was so much music available. And there, the change is, the big change is that there's more of it now than ever. And um, the reason I gave up on pop music a long time ago is because every time I heard about something that was supposed to be interesting, I'd go and listen to it, and nine times out of ten, I'd be terribly disappointed. Mm -hmm. And the reason for that is because there's just so damn much of it. Every kid in his bed set with a laptop can write a song, record it, publish it, get it on the internet, you know. And it's, um, frankly, I think that a smaller and smaller a portion of that kind of music is worth anything. It's because uh, it's just like politics. Um, what I've been saying for years now about Facebook and social media is that every barroom bore has an audience of millions. You used to be able to ignore the cranks and the trolls, but you can't anymore because they're making policy. They're running for president. Mm -hmm. um, and it's, it's a similar phenomenon in music. There's just too much of it. And too much of it is second rate or worse. At the same time, though, uh, you know, with social media, people are made to feel like they actually have a voice when in reality only a few hundred people might be listening to them. Yeah. Um, 
it always feels good to find somebody that agrees with you. <laughs> um, and there are, I don't, I don't know how, but I got away now from uh, reading a lot of trashy commentary. I don't, I don't come across many trolls because I don't, I guess the people that I associate with on um, social media are not people who attract that kind of stuff. Uh, Heather Cox Richardson is a favorite of ours. She's a history professor at, uh, I think, Boston University. And uh, she just writes, she writes a daily letter. And it's, um, it's about history. It's about how we got to where we are now. It's about the Civil War uh, and the founding fathers and all that. And it's, it's factual. A lot of what we think we know, a lot of what we've been taught all our lives like when i was a kid in school i think i was taught that the civil war wasn't about slavery it was about uh, states rights mm -hmm. well we know we know it was about slavery because the confederacy said it was loudly and often um so there's no doubt about that but that's not what i was taught in school and uh, from heather cox Richardson, you get the straight facts fascinating facts that uh, maybe you never knew before because she's a really a very highly qualified, very learned history teacher. And um, when I see the comments on her stuff on Facebook, there's, there are very few trolls because the kind of people who might benefit from reading her stuff the most aren't reading it at all. So, uh, <laughs> so the commentary tends to be really civilized. Yeah. And, um, but but I do occasionally, you know, I see somebody rather says something and then there's there's 230 comments. And if I glance at them, most of them are totally off the wall. Uh, I don't know who reads that stuff, but they um, some of the crazies clearly feed on each other. Yeah. And if you think, for example, that what you were taught in uh, school about the Civil War decades ago has not necessarily changed that much in certain states like Tennessee where certain words like slavery uh, related to the uh, uh, Civil War are still taboo in certain parts of this country so we really haven't come that far have we in some cases um, no I don't know I don't I don't know very much about what's taught in high schools nowadays I never had any history in high school at all um, and I hope that's, I hope that's improved, but I imagine it depends on where you live. Mm -hmm. Um, I don't know what else to say about that. I wish I did know more about it. And this is the end of part one of my conversation with author Donald Clark. My name is Anton Garcia Fernandez, and I thank you for listening to another episode of the Written Page Podcast on my YouTube channel, Anton GF. Please stay tuned for part two in which Donald Clark and I will discuss the life, music, and times of Frank Sinatra. <laughs>